Last time, Ptolemy Coronos had murdered Seleucus in cold blood and had seized the throne of Macedon. Once Coronos had seized the throne, Antigonus Gonatus immediately sought to take the opportunity to depose him and regain Macedon for the Antigonid dynasty. Putting his men onto ships, Antigonus attempted a naval invasion of Thrace, but was met en route by Coronus at the head of Lysimachus's old navy and was repulsed. Coronos advanced into Macedonia proper and married Arsinoe, who was the widow of Lysimachus and also his own half-sister. As well, he adopted her children with Lysimachus, Ptolemy Epigonos, Lysimachus Jr., and Philip, in the hope that this would prevent them from seeking his overthrow. After all, he had killed Seleucus, the man who had been responsible for their father's death. Surely, they should be in his debt. Nevertheless, Lysimachus Jr. was wary of his new stepfather. But where was Antiochus in all of this? Should he not have sought to avenge his own father? Well, as soon as Seleucus died, it became apparent that much of the empire had been held together by his own personality and reputation. And once Antiochus became king, large parts of the empire sought to secede, and so the new king immediately became bogged down fighting rebel groups, particularly in Syria and Asia Minor, while the regions he had earlier governed in the east of the empire remained loyal. While these initial rebellions were eventually extinguished, they meant for the time being that no punitive expedition against Coronos was feasible, so instead a peace treaty was resolved between the two. At the same time, Coronos had one of his daughters married to Pyrrhus, securing his western border, while the Epirot king abandoned his plans for Greece, for the time being, and went campaigning in Italy and Sicily. It is also worth noting here that about this time, a second Achaean League was formed, initially just by the cities of Patras and Dime, but the League would continue to expand in the coming decades. At this time, Antiochus was afflicted by another conflict, as Ptolemy Philadelphus, the king of Egypt, invaded his holdings on the Anatolian coast. We do not know the precise details of this war, but it is recorded that the city of Miletus went from being under Seleucid control in 280 BC to under Ptolemaic control in 279. So, presumably, the war was short and resulted in the Ptolemaic conquest of the coast of Caria. Taking advantage of this conflict, the Cappadocians, with the aid of Armenia, repudiated Seleucid domination and expelled the garrisons there. Antiochus, busy repelling Ptolemy, was not in a position to prevent this secession, but due to the unavoidable Seleucid dominance in the region, the two nations remained on good terms, with Cappadocia remaining largely reliant on the Seleucids, much as Armenia had been. In Macedon, Ptolemy Epigonos had launched a rebellion against his stepfather, with many cities rising up and joining him. Ptolemy Coronos, in retaliation, had had Lysimachus Jr. and Philip murdered, stabbed to death by assassins in front of their own mother, who pleaded for their lives. No mercy was given, and the rebellion failed, with Ptolemy Epigonos fleeing to Illyria, and Queen Arsinoe fleeing to Samothrace, and then on to Egypt. The Gauls, who inhabited the lands to the northwest of the Balkan Peninsula, had been gradually expanding. In the previous century, they had invaded the Italian peninsula, sacked Rome, and settled in the Po Valley, and then in Pannonia. It seems probable that they attempted to move south into the Balkans and into Greece proper, and had been generally repulsed, but the overall evidence for this is quite unspecific and speculative. However, in 279 BC, a great migration occurred, spurred by overpopulation in the pre-existing Gallic lands and by a desire in their warriors for plunder. According to Justin, this migration was 300,000 strong, but was divided into three contingents. The first was led by Carethrius, and was to attack the Thracians and the Tribali tribe. The second was led by Brennus, of no apparent relation to the Brennus who sacked Rome, and Dachycorius, and was aimed at Paeonia. And the third was led by Bolgus, who was to invade Illyria and Macedon. Hearing of this, Ptolemy Coronos marched north to meet them, but with a hastily gathered force against the advice of his officers, apparently thinking little of the Gallic threat. The king of the Dardanians offered to combine forces with the Macedonians to fight the Gauls, but Coronos, in his arrogance, rudely refused their assistance. Bolgus sent an envoy to Coronos, offering him peace in exchange for tribute. Coronos taunted the Gauls, saying that they were afraid of war, and then gave them a counteroffer, surrendered to him all their chiefs and all of their weapons, and then he would let them go. 
Shortly after this, the Gauls attacked. Kuranos, who had been fighting on elephant back, fell and was captured alive. He was then beheaded, his head was placed on a spear, and was paraded in front of his army, who were thereafter massacred, with only a few managing to escape. Once the news of this reached Macedonia, the people panicked and began praying to the spirits of Philip II and Alexander to bring them deliverance. Malega, the brother of Ptolemy, took the reins of power, but after just a couple of days he was compelled to abdicate by Antipater, a nephew of Cassander. While this was happening, a Macedonian general, Sosthenes, quickly raised a new force and repelled a Gallic attack, after which he was hailed as the new king, overthrowing Antipater after just 45 days. Sosthenes, known for his humility, did not take the title of king, but ruled as a general. After this, many of the Gauls returned to the north. Yet Brennus, leading his contingent, invaded Greece and ransacked Thessaly. Because Greece had been in a state of near-constant war for many years now, the people were generally exhausted, and they did not have much of a stomach for a fierce fight. Nevertheless, the people from Phocis, Boeotia, Attica, and Aetolia raised an army to defend themselves. They were joined by a small group of mercenaries and officers sent by Antigonus and Antiochus. This army of about 20,000 men assembled at the pass of Thermopylae to make a stand against the Gallic invasion. Hearing that the Gauls were already nearby, the Greeks sent a detachment of cavalry to destroy any bridges over the river Spurkaos and to harry any attempted crossing. But Brennus sent a large detachment of 10,000 men towards the mouth of the river, where it became more of a marsh than a true river, and crossed there by paddling across on their shields, which forced the Greek detachment to retreat. The Gauls then forced the local people to rebuild the destroyed bridges so the rest of the army could make a crossing. They then ravaged the environs of Heraclea and Trachis, but could not take the city itself, as it had a resolute garrison of Aetolians. Moving on, Brennus decided to confront the Greeks at Thermopylae head on. The Gauls, despite their ferocity, were defeated by the Hellenes due to the force multiplier that the pass provided, forcing the Gauls into a narrow front and denying them the use of their famed cavalry. The Greeks buried their dead, but the bodies of the Gauls were left to sink away into the muddy ground. The Gauls then attempted to cross Mount Eta, by way of which they could bypass the Greek army, but they were repelled by a garrison there. Brennus, seeing no way to advance through brute force, conceived a cunning plan. Instead of attacking directly, he sent a large detachment west to ravage Aetolia, knowing that a large proportion of the Greek defenders were Aetolians. The Gauls first sacked the town of Calion. The butchery these Gauls engaged in was horrific. Not just the usual plundering, but a wholesale genocide of every living thing. The mass rape of women, both alive and dead, and the devouring of corpses. When the news of this came to the Aetolians at Thermopylae, it had its intended effect, with the Aetolian contingent, the largest single part of the army, at once marching back to their homeland to defend it. This they did successfully, inflicting a great defeat onto the Gauls there, but while they were away, Brennus put the next stage of his plan into action. The local people, at this point thinking not about the preservation of Greece, but of their own homes and lives, had shown Brennus the path around Thermopylae, which had been used by the Persians against Leonidas centuries before. Brennus led a detachment of 40,000 men over this path and around the Greek position, while the rest of the Gallic army made to close the encirclement from the north. The Phocians were the first to meet Brennus's advance and their resistance gave time for the rest of the Greeks to embark on Athenian ships in the Malian Gulf, but the pass was lost, and the allied army was scattered. The Gauls next made for the sacred sanctuary of Delphi, whose storehouses were filled with rich treasures. According to Cassius Dio, the Gauls sacked Delphi and took its treasures, which were eventually found by the Romans when they sacked Tolosa in 109 BC. According to Strabo, quoting from Poseidonius, the treasure had already been looted during the sacred wars by the Phocians. According to Pausanias and Justin, however, with the intervention of the gods, who sent first violent thunderstorms and then a blizzard, a massive defeat was inflicted upon the Gauls here, with Brennus himself being severely wounded and not long after taking his own life. After this, the Gauls withdrew from Greece itself, being harried along the way by the Aetolians, and afterwards by the people of each land they entered, until they were destroyed. 
While this had been happening, Antiochus had sent one of his generals, Patrocles, to subjugate the cities in Bithynia, which had asserted their independence following the death of Lysimachus, under the leadership of Zipoetes I. Patrocles appointed a subordinate, Hermogenes of Aspendus, to lead the attack. Hermogenes made a pact with the city of Heraclea, and then marched into Bithynia proper, where his army was ambushed and utterly destroyed. After this had occurred, Antiochus sought to mount a punitive expedition. In 278 BC, Zipoetes I died, and his kingdom was divided among his sons, with the most prominent being Nicomedes. Nicomedes made a defensive pact with Heraclea, who themselves had paid many other cities along the Black Sea coast to be allied with them, forming what is sometimes called the Northern League. For the time being, however, no expedition came. Rather, Antigonus had sought to once again try to gain a foothold in Thrace, over which he came into conflict with Antiochus. In this conflict, Nicomedes aligned himself with Antigonus. A few skirmishes were fought, but no decisive battles took place. Antiochus then sent his navy to attack Bithynia, which was met by a coalition fleet arrayed against him. The two navies had a standoff, but neither side attacked, and so both eventually withdrew. After this, peace was re-established between Antigonus and Antiochus, with the Seleucid king giving up his designs on Bithynia. Antigonus would take Western Thrace, and in return recognise Seleucid claims to parts of Eastern Thrace, but this would only be on paper, as Antiochus would never make a European expedition to impose his rule there. Relations between Antigonus and Antiochus would greatly improve in the coming years, with Antigonus marrying Phila, Antiochus' sister, and with the two united by a common foe in the form of Ptolemy. About this time, Sosthenes, the king of Macedon, died suddenly, and the kingdom fell into anarchy. Many tried to seize power, including Ptolemy Epigonos and Alexander, the sons of Lysimachus, but it was Antigonus who began to assert his power over the region. It was now that the detachment of Gauls, led by Cerethrius, who had originally been sent to Thrace, made their appearance, who had by now defeated the Getae and the Tribali. An army of 18,000 men sent ambassadors to Antigonus, offering to leave him be in exchange for tribute, the same offer the Gauls had earlier made to Ptolemy Coronos. Antigonus hosted these envoys, treating them as honoured guests and lavishing them with riches. This display of wealth only had the effect to encourage the Gauls by showing to them just how much they could capture from him through a war. Once the ambassadors had returned, they led the Gauls back to Antigonus' camp with the intention of sacking it. Cunning Antigonus had foreseen this though, and they found his camp abandoned and empty. The Gauls then moved along the coast, being stalked all the way along by Antigonus' army, which had hid itself in the woods. As the Gauls ransacked some ships, Antigonus fell upon them, and with their backs to the sea, he slaughtered them. After this, Antigonus, seen as a hero, was accepted as king across all of Macedonia. However, though this one army had been destroyed, the rest of the horde of Gauls that had been dispatched to Thrace was still at large, and they attacked Byzantium. With the help of the Northern League, the Byzantines held and prevented the Gauls from crossing into Asia. The Gauls remained in southern Thrace for some time, seizing what they could from the less well-defended towns and villages there, and some of the Gauls established a small kingdom. Nicomedes of Bithynia, however, saw an opportunity here, an opportunity to gain a powerful ally who could help him secure his kingdom and potentially aid him in any future battles with the Seleucid Empire. He contacted the Gauls and made a pact with them. He would bring them across to Asia in exchange for their support in any war against his enemies or for his allies. They agreed, and Nicomedes ferried the Gallic Horde to Asia, where they began to trouble the people there, plundering towns across the coast. With the Gauls in his army, and with the aid of Heraclea, Nicomedes conquered the rest of Bithynia, which had been under the rule of his brother, Zipoetes II. After this initial service for Nicomedes, the Gallic Horde continued onward, and crossed into Seleucid territory, ravaging any towns which would not pay them tribute. Though there is some debate about the date, most likely in 275 BC, Antiochus hurriedly gathered together a small army, mostly of lighter troops and skirmishers, and went to meet them. Upon seeing the size of the Gallic force, with its tens of thousands of cavalry and war chariots, Antiochus had second thoughts and was considering withdrawing. One of his officers, Theodotus of Rhodes, came up with a plan which gave Antiochus some hope. They hid the 16 elephants they had in the army until the Gallic cavalry and chariots had charged. 
At this moment, the elephants were revealed, and they engaged the Gauls, causing the horses and their riders to recoil in fear of these strange monsters, which they had never before seen. The horsemen and the charioteers lost control of their mounts, which whirled back towards the bulk of the Gallic army, crashing into it and breaking both, while the elephants bore down upon them, tossing and goring their scattered enemies. Afterward, there was much celebration in the Seleucid camp, with drinking and singing. Antiochus, however, had tears in his eyes. My men, we have more reason for shame, saved by those sixteen brutes. If their strangeness had not produced the panic, where should we have been? Afterwards, a statue of an elephant was raised to mark the site of the battle. His story, largely drawn from an oration given by Lucian, certainly has some questionable components, such as the numbers involved, or the practicality of concealing Indian elephants on the battlefield, and some modern scholars have denied the existence of the elephant victory altogether. But we also know from the Byzantine Suda that Simonides of Magnesia, who was a well-known poet contemporary with either Antiochus I or his great-grandson, wrote a great ode to the king and to his victory with elephants over the Gauls. Appian also mentions that Antiochus defeated the Gauls in Asia, for which he earned the title Sota, the Saviour. As such, it seems the battle did exist in some form. It was a great victory for Antiochus, and that elephants were a crucial component. Seeing in the great usefulness in having Gallic troops available to him, Antiochus settled the remaining Gauls in the Anatolian Plateau, on the west bank of the river Halys, who lent their name to the region, Galatia. It is also fair to speculate that Antiochus was too militarily weak at this stage to completely annihilate the Gauls, so providing them with some land was simply the path of least resistance. That would certainly cohere with his acceptance of the independence of Bithynia and Cappadocia, alongside the fact that the Galatians would still act unilaterally at times. Antiochus and Nicomedes were not the only rulers to see the benefit of using Gallic soldiers, and most of the rulers of the Greek world would engage their services during this period. One such ruler was Pyrrhus of Epirus, who, after having failed in his campaigns in Italy, had returned to Greece to conduct a war against Antigonus, and recruited a great many Gauls into his army for this purpose. He attacked and defeated Antigonus, seizing much of Macedonia in the process. In the following years, he engaged in an inconclusive war against the Lacedaemonians, and then engaged in a battle at Argos, whose internal political struggles had become something of a proxy war for Antigonus and himself. During this battle, an elderly Argive woman struck him on the head with a roof tail, resulting in his death. Antigonus stepped once again into the power of vacuum, and reasserted his control over Greece and Macedonia. Without the military genius of Pyrrhus at its helm, the kingdom of Epirus would gradually sink into obscurity, and, in only a matter of decades, total dissolution. Antiochus had concluded an alliance with Magas, Ptolemy's half-brother by his mother, and a rebel who had recently overthrown Ptolemaic rule in the Pentapolis. Magas had then marched on Egypt itself, but had been unsuccessful, as he was faced with an attack of Libyan nomads in his rear, and had to withdraw to defend his own cities. Somewhat foolishly, he had left the Pentapolis poorly defended on purpose, so that if they rebelled against him while he was gone, he could easily retake them afterwards. This had the, perhaps, foreseeable consequence of making them vulnerable to attack from the Libyans too. At the same time, Ptolemy was himself unable to make any offensive inroads west, as a band of Gallic mercenaries he had hired sought to rebel. He managed to trap them on an island, and left them there to starve to death, which he celebrated as though he'd won a great victory, in mimicry of Antigonus and Antiochus. Around this time, Magas had married Antiochus's daughter, Apama, and convinced Antiochus to break the peace with the Ptolemies and invade Egypt. Antiochus probably took little convincing, as the cities of Phoenicia and Kole Syria were wealthy and strategically valuable, and he maintained that due to the treaty after the Battle of Ipsus, these territories were rightfully Seleucid, but before any invasion of Ptolemaic Syria could take place, Philadelphus had gotten wind of this agreement, and had in 274 BC launched a preemptive strike into northern Syria. Antiochus, who was still in Sardis at the time, not long having fought his elephant victory, sent orders to gather soldiers from across the empire, while he rushed to Syria to lead the defence, along with his eldest son, named Seleucus, who was the viceroy of the east, as Antiochus had been before he became king of the whole empire. 
Upon his arrival, the Egyptian troops, who had made few gains against the fortified Seleucid cities, pulled back. Perhaps indicative of the same caution of Ptolemy Sota being present in his son. The war after this did not have any decisive engagements that we know of, as both sides were in possession of strongly fortified cities, and so the borders remained effectively status quo antebellum when peace was brokered in 271 BC. Following this, the Seleucid Empire experienced its first consecutive years of peace since Antiochus' accession. During peacetime, Antiochus conducted the regimen of city founding, which his father had established. In Phrygia, Antiochus refounded the city of Kelene at a new location downstream, which he named Apamea, into which many Jews were settled. In the east, he settled an Antioch in Magiana and an Antioch in Persis. In order to box in the gains Ptolemy Philadelphus had made in Caria, Antiochus founded new cities inland, which could act as checks on any further Egyptian advances. These were Stratonikia in Caria, named for his wife, and Seleucia on the Maeander, which was a refounding of the earlier town of Anthea. Antiochus also restored an ancient temple in the Babylonian city of Borsippa, a fact that is recorded in a wonderfully well-preserved cylinder, which recounts how Antiochus, son of Seleucus, king of the world, rebuilt the temple to the god Nabu, and contains a prayer for the well-being of his consort Stratonike and his son, King Seleucus. The period of peace was only broken by an incident in 267 BC, when Antiochus' son Seleucus attempted a rebellion against his father. This resulted in him being defeated and executed, but no more of the affair is known. His position as heir and viceroy in the east was then taken by Antiochus' second son, Antiochus. Perhaps taking advantage of this temporary instability, Ptolemy seized the border city of Ephesus and incorporated it into his Carian holdings. Back in Greece, a new war had developed between an alliance of Greek city-states, led by Athens and Sparta, and backed by Ptolemy and his navy, against the hegemony of Antigonus. From Monides, an Athenian statesman put out a decree declaring their alliance and repudiating the domination of Antigonus, claiming he was a threat to their freedom and was suppressing their ancient institutions, as the Macedonian king had made a practice of placing puppet rulers in many of the Greek city-states. Antigonus responded by marching south and ravaging Attica. Ptolemy dispatched a fleet to Athens, but it could do little to stop an army which was supplied by land, and was reduced to conducting supply runs for the beleaguered Athenians. In 265 BC, the Macedonian army defeated the Spartans and their allies at Corinth, slaying the Spartan king Aureus in the process. And Antigonus maintained his devastation of the Greek countryside, Eventually, Athens capitulated to Antigonus in 261 BC. In 263 BC, Philetaerus, the lord of Pergamon, and loyal vassal of the Seleucids, died. As a eunuch, he had been unable to produce any children of his own, so he left the city to his nephew, Eumenes. Philetaerus, who had owed his principality to Seleucus Nicator, was deeply loyal to the empire, and had always minted his coins with a depiction of Seleucus. Unlike his uncle, Eumenes felt no such loyalty towards Antiochus, and repudiated his rule, minting coins showing Philetaerus instead. Knowing Antiochus would not simply let him secede, Eumenes acted quickly, and marched a force to Sardis, the Seleucid regional capital. Eumenes won a victory there, and with Sardis, the seat of Seleucid power in the west, now at the mercy of Pergamon, Antiochus agreed to peace, and to allow Pergamonian independence and with it most of the territory of Aeolus. Yet another territory had managed to slip through Antiochus's hands, and this time it would not remain in alignment with the Empire, as Pergamon, situated on the Aegean, had more choice in allies. In 261 BC, shortly after the loss of Pergamon, and after a reign of 20 years, Antiochus died of unknown causes, and was succeeded by his son, Antiochus II. What do we make of Antiochus Sota? He has often in the past been called an incompetent king, which is certainly not wholly undeserved. After all, during his reign, the hope of taking Macedon and Thrace was lost. The coast of Caria was captured by Ptolemy. Armenia, Cappadocia, and Pergamon all asserted their independence, to varying degrees. 
Antiochus's attempts at expansion into Bithynia and Ptolemaic Syria all came to naught. While he defeated the Gauls, he ultimately still had to grant them status as a quasi-independent vassal. Even his own son, Seleucus, rebelled against him, though we know not why. On the other hand, he had come to power unexpectedly, with his father, although quite aged, still being seemingly very active and fit before his murder. This sudden accession, combined with the recent incorporation of a large swath of Asia Minor, led to instability and revolts against the new king's rule. He was denied any kind of honeymoon period, but instead was thrust into years of continuous war against numerous foes, wars that he often had a hand in waging personally. With this in mind, it is perhaps impressive that Antiochus managed to hold together the empire at all, given its vast size and multitude of peoples. It very easily could have balkanized further, and his military efforts largely prevented this. While he did not make any gains against Ptolemy Philadelphus or Antigonus Gonatus, at the same time, he also did not lose much ground to them either, just the territories in Caria, which Ptolemy had seized in the first years of his reign. The founder of the empire, Seleucus Nicator, had been a generational talent among a talented generation, which had played a large part in why he was able to continuously expand his empire. On the other hand, Antiochus was ultimately somebody who was thrust into a position he did not quite have the talent to make the most of. But he managed to make do in the face of strong opposition and still left a substantial, if diminished, kingdom to hand down to his son, Antiochus. Next time we shall see how the young Antiochus II will fare against his older and more experienced political rivals as the battle for the Aegean intensifies. If you have any comments, criticism, or questions, please post them below. And thank you for listening.